Hi, this is Tom Soane and welcome to another drive-by episode of The Anonymous Landlord because these are the things that I think about on my way home from the office tonight. And uh, today, I saw a Facebook post from somebody who just put a post into a group asking whether a property deal that he'd bought or had an offer accepted on was a good deal or not. Very standard, valid question. I see him quite a lot. So he put together some numbers on that post of the purchase price, the stamp duty, the rent yield, the refurbishment cost and so on, and he'd calculated his return on investment. But he'd missed out quite a lot of different costs and charges that would need to be calculated into that property deal. And it actually turned out to be yeah an average property deal not the best you could go for not the worst but not the best so i wanted to share with everybody all of those costs that you should take into account if you're buying a buy to let property so this guy like i say he wrote down his purchase price his stamp duty his cost of refurbishment uh his legal fees and then he wrote into the post a, uh, a rent valuation, so how much rent he was going to be able to achieve, minus his mortgage payment. So from that, he had calculated a profit and also the cash that he was going to be leaving in the property. Now look, you've all heard me talk about true yield and cash yield. Um, I'm just going to talk about the cash yield for now because... Uh, true yield is a much more complex calculation. It is the true yield of that property investment, but for the purposes of this, we're just gonna talk about a cash yield, which basically means you are leaving in a certain amount of cash, of your actual cash in that property, and that actual cash is gonna generate you a certain return on that investment. So that's your cash yield. Meaning the cash that you have used and is currently employed in that property. That's your cash, and the net profit you receive on that cash is your cash yield. Hope that makes sense. Anyway, so look, of course, from the purchase, you need to include your purchase price, of course. You need to include your stamp duty, yes. You need to include the legal fees. Now, the legal fees can be anywhere from a thousand pounds up to about 1200, 1300 pounds. Might be a bit more, might be a bit less, but generally speaking, that is the sweet spot, which will include the legal fee as well as all of the disbursements, meaning all of the other little charges and costs that your solicitor will spend on your behalf. Transaction fees and registration fees and so on and so on and so on. So your lawyer should be able to give you a breakdown of those fees, but generally speaking, you'll be looking at about 12 or 1300 quid. Somewhere around that figure would be a safe way to, to forecast. So yeah, you've got your legal fees, your stamp duty, your purchase price. Now, remember, you're not gonna, in all cases, you're not gonna have to use 100% of the purchase price. That's not gonna be 100% of your money. You might be raising a mortgage on that to buy that property, and that might be, that might account for 75% of the purchase price. It might be more, it might be less, but obviously the rest is your deposit. Now that's not necessarily a fee or a charge that goes into your property investment. Um, however, you still need to account for it because you will need that cash. And then there are other costs in purchasing that property. You might need to take into account a, sur a survey or a mortgage valuation cost. You might also need to pay for the lender's legal costs. That sounds really crazy, right? You've got to pay for the lender's lawyer? Yep, in some cases you do. Now you can find that out before you uh, pay for it or before you buy the property, depending on which lender you're gonna go with. Now, if you're buying with a mortgage, you will also need to take into account a mortgage broker fee. In some cases, there are some mortgage brokers that don't charge a broker fee. I've always found that the better mortgage advisors do charge a broker fee 
However, there are some really good mortgage brokers that don't. So I don't want to write them off. I'm just saying that generally speaking, a good mortgage broker will charge a fee. You can normally pay that on completion, but sometimes a mortgage broker will ask maybe for 50% in advance because they're going to do a lot of work for you, or they might ask for all of it in advance. Br mortgage broker to mortgage broker, it's always different. And then you also need to take into account involved in your purchase is the cost of borrowing. Now, in a lot of cases, your mortgage lender will charge you an arrangement fee. They may also charge you some form of admin fee, administration fee. So you can find that stuff out before you actually complete the purchase or even before you make the offer if you want to. So those are a load of costs that you should take into account. And again, I'm being quite general here, uh, but this is on the purchase side, because now we need to talk about the other end. Once you own the property and you're generating rent income, what are you going to deduct from that rent that's coming into your bank? Well, look, first of all, your mortgage payment, fair enough. So let's say, for an example, you are generating... £500 per month in rent and your mortgage payments are going to be £150 per month. So you're left then with £350. But you also have to deduct something for management of that property. Normally that's about 10%, so that's another 50 quid. And that's going to take you down to £300 per month. Now, you might manage that property yourself. I definitely don't advise it to any landlords that are getting into uh, property investment. But if you feel like you are qualified, capable, and you have the knowledge of all the legislation to be able to do that, then best of luck to you. Go for it. Um, but if not, cost of management, normally about 10%. Worth its weight in gold as well, might I add, but I'll let you decide that. And by the way, if you want some advice about managing your own rental property or you want my company to, company to manage that property for you, doesn't matter where it is in the country, uh, my company will manage that property for you. Um, just give us a shout. You know, you can contact me through Facebook or you can email me, tom at pinkstreet.co.uk, and we'll just have a chat, see if it's right for you. I've got a few different options. Some options, actually, for uh, self-managing landlords. So if you want to manage that property yourself, I do, my company, Pink Street, do offer a service for self-managing landlords just to make sure that you're compliant and you've got support with collecting rent and so on and so on. Anyway, give us a shout, or not, it's up to you. So uh, yeah, management, normally about 10%, there or thereabouts. You also need to take into account the cost of maintenance and repairs and compliance. Now, normally I would allow about 10% of the rent each month for maintenance, repairs and compliance. Things like your gas safety certificate, any general repairs, fixing a leak and so on. Now, again, it might be more, it might be less. If it's less than you make extra profit, brilliant. But I always put that into a pot every single month, just so that if, uh, I don't know, if something goes wrong with a property and it needs fixing, there's not any lump sum payments that are required. It's already there, it's already sat in my maintenance pot, ready to, to pay for something that needs fixing. So uh, yeah, generally speaking, if you allow 10% for that, 10% for management, it's 20% of the rent, just to go towards management and maintenance of your property investment. And then you've got to take into account insurance. Now, you can get landlord insurance that covers a lot more. So for an example, you can get certain landlord policies that cover your rent, so you can claim back any lost rent where the tenant doesn't pay. You can get landlord insurance that covers against tenant damages. You can get insurance that covers against uh, building damage or buildings insurance. You can get legal cover. You can get loads and loads of different landlords insurances. But generally speaking, if you get a simple 
um, insurance policy, which is good for landlords, then you might be looking at around the 20 quid a month mark, depending on the property, depending on the, the type of uh, property that you've rented out, but also depending on you. Because also, if you're a portfolio landlord, it's worth considering portfolio landlord insurance. It might save you a few quid, it might cover you a bit more, um, so have a look into that. If, by the way, hey, if you want me to connect you up with my mortgage, uh, sorry, my insurance broker, then let me know. I'll just connect you up by email. Just send me a message through Facebook or email me, tom at pinkstreet.co.uk. Anyway, yes, so that's your insurance taken into account. Now, once you've deducted all of those things, then you're left with your profit. But that's not your net profit, because the most common thing that people miss out is the bloody tax. And yes, no one wants to pay tax. Of course we don't, but we've got to. So there's a couple of ways that that tax is gonna work very generically. There are, you, you do need to speak to a tax advisor or your accountant so that you can be very clear on your tax position with property investing, with anything really. Now, if, generally speaking, if you own the property through a limited company, then you're gonna spend, your tax is gonna be on the profit made in that company. So once you've deducted all the expenses, mortgage payment, I'm just parking by the way, once you've deducted the mortgage payment and all of the expenses involved with uh, renting that property, that's what you'll be taxed on. And that's a corporation tax. You'll also be taxed on anything you pay yourself from that company. So if you're smart with it, you can make sure that you are being efficient with tax. That's probably the best way to describe it, but speak to a tax advisor. But definitely take into account the tax that you're going to pay. Because otherwise, if you don't forecast for that, and then all of a sudden, you get hit with a tax bill, which just wipes out all of your profit, it's going to be quite upsetting. So yeah, work that out. So in a, in a limited company, you're going to pay one type of tax. In If you own that property as a personal name, then you're going to pay income tax, which is different. It also means you can't offset the mortgage payments against that income. The rent is your income, and that's where it can get quite expensive. That's why people tend to buy uh, properties in a limited company, so that they can make that tax expenditure much more efficient. So uh, look, I hope that helps. Just to recap very quickly, when you are renting a property out, oh, there's a couple more charges as well, I'll, I'll just mention in a second. But up until now, on your purchase, don't forget your, ta your stamp duty, your legal fees, all of your disbursements, your mortgage valuer, your surveyor, potentially lenders legal fees, mortgage broker fees, mortgage lender admin fees, and so on and so on and so on, all those things. But also don't forget when you're renting the property out, you've got to include your insurance, your management and maintenance and repairs, your compliance, all of those costs. However, if you're going to rent this property out, then there is also going to be a cost for letting the property. There's also going to be a cost for preparing the property for rental. And this is whether you do this yourself or not. There's going to be a cost. If you're going to advertise a property yourself, or you're going to get a letting agent to do it, or whoever, then there could well be a cost. So factor that in to your, um, to your figures. And also factor in the cost of preparing the property. For an example, smoke alarms and maybe fire doors or, you know, all of those things, furnishings and, and what have you, whatever you're going to buy. Make sure you factor that cost in. And uh, what you'll be left with is pure profit, free money. That's it. And that's what we're all going for, right? Just make sure you're including all of those costs and trying to make yourself some free money. And remember, be an anonymous landlord. You don't need to do all this stuff yourself. If you get the right people to do the right jobs at the right time and you outsource all of that, you may well make a small amount less profit, but you'll have a much, you'll, well, you'll just have much more time for yourself, much less energy expended on your investment, much less hassle and stress, 
and you'll be able to spend more time with your friends and family or doing whatever you love doing. So I hope that helps. And if it did, then let me know. It's tom at pinkstreet.co.uk. If it didn't, then let me know. Tom at pinkstreet.co.uk. I really like your help. If I could, in uh, understanding what you guys want me to advise on and what you guys want me to talk about. It's quite important because it helps me make these um, and share that knowledge with other people. Right. By the way, before I go, <laughs> before I go, there is the argument about forecasting for void periods. So this is a bit of a grey area because if you're working out the yield of a property, it is impossible to state what void periods there are going to be in this property. However, what we can do is we can take an educated guess, right? When you buy this property, if it's gonna take you a month to refurbish and then a month to let out and then a month to get a tenant moved in, that's gonna cost you three months of mortgage payments without anybody moving in. At the same time, it might not be that, but if you've forecasted for that, then you're covered. So now how do you work out rent voids? Meaning over the next 10 years, how many rent payments is the tenant that's in that property going to miss? Well, that again is impossible to, no one can predict the future. But what we can do is work out a rough figure. Now, generally speaking, I would allow 5% of the rent to go towards arrears. Now, what I mean by that, you would be unlucky if you had more than one missed rent payment every two or three years. I would quite happily say that a safe estimate is gonna be about one missed rent payment every four years. So work it out for yourself, but for an example, the average rent arrears across the country, and this isn't confirmed, but the average rent arrears across the country is probably around 3%, something like that. So that gives you an idea of what the rent arrears are possibly going to be for you. But you know what? If you've got a good letting agent by your side, then you should, in theory, avoid rent arrears. So I hope you do. Anyway, I'd love your feedback. Let me know what you think of that. If you want to have a chat with me, then book a discovery call. Just email me, tom at pinkstreet.co.uk, and I'll be able to help. I'll advise. I'll do my best to give you information or advice on anything that you need help with. Speak to you all later.